Hello everyone and welcome to Friends with Cancer, How to Help. My name is Marla Hartson and I'm your host. And before we get started, I want to kind of give a little disclaimer. And that is that um, I'm going to be treating this topic with humor. And I believe that that's a really powerful approach. But cancer itself is not funny. And there are times in our life when our hearts are broken and even the birds singing is offensive. If you're in a place like that today, I'm gonna to ask that you please do not watch this. Um, please just wait for another day. But if you know someone who's in a place like that, then this class is definitely for you. And please join with us. So having said that, let's get started. My name is Marla Hartson. I have been married forever. 40 years last September. And you know how they say that husbands and wives start to look like each other when they've been married a long time? Well, <laughs> my husband's bald and I had cancer. Not how I thought that was going to go. But one thing is that I do not really take kindly to people talking about having a bad hair day because my hair took a year off. I started using humor as a way to fight fear. I guess I've done it maybe always, but I certainly got a lot better at it <laughs> during my time in the Valley of Cancer. And so when I was actually told I would have chemo, I would lose my hair, I decided to go shopping for the wig before all that happened. So let's do it while I'm healthy, take a friend, go to a strip mall, look at lots of wigs, have a good time. But no, that's not how it works. When you're a cancer patient, you go to a boutique because you need your privacy. My boutique was in a garage and they had 12 wigs and they were all blonde. <laughs> I'm not blonde. So I said, do you have anything that's not blonde? And they said, yeah, here. And they brought out Asian. It was long, straight, black hair and I looked like a dead witch. I'm looking in the mirror and I'm going, I haven't even started chemo and I look like I'm dead already. And I turned to my sister and she said, not your best look, honey. And we laughed. If you're out there, Vicki, hello. <laughs> and you know, that's the power of a friend that I'm gonna be talking about. But anyway, we, we tried on all the wigs and the one that we liked the best was um, an Irish setter red, like my sister-in-law Sue wears, hi Sue. And it was kind of a fair faucet cut like Marnie was wearing back then, hi Marnie. And it was named Evelyn, like my mama, who we lost a year ago. And anyway, when I got home, my husband said, eh, keep looking. <laughs> he gave me the American Cancer Society catalog, which uh, miraculously shows up at your house when you're diagnosed with cancer, which is a good thing. But as I looked through it, I noticed they were not all blonde. There were even some women of color. But somehow they all had blue eyes. What's with this blue eyes? I, and, you know, my skin, very Scandinavian, clearly, I can say I'm from Minnesota and people will believe me. But my hair, it's got another ethnicity going on. And so that wasn't working for me. And then I realized, oh yeah, women of color don't need to go to the American Cancer Society to get a wig. They already know where to get wigs. So I asked around, I said, where's a good wig shop? They told me, I walked in. Uh, the woman there, by the way, was Asian, had long, straight black hair, looked good on her. And I told her I was a cancer patient. She was actually a survivor also. I said, I want hair that looks like this. And she said, I've got it. It was 35 bucks. It even had a little gray in it, which I pay to make sure I don't. So, but it gave it a feeling of authenticity. I put it on. I went to see my husband. He knew I was wig shopping. So I'm looking at him. Hi, honey. I'm going to look at uh, my uh, photographer, uh, Tom. I looked at my husband. I said, hi. He's given me that nervous smile, just like every guy gets when his wife looks like that. He's trying hard not to laugh. He's so embarrassed. It does that to guys every time. But 
he finally triggered and he said, that's a wig? Which, it was so my hair. I helped my children with their homework. They didn't even notice. But the best one was when I lost my hair. I wore it to the first oncologist appointment after that. And she was so confused. She's looking at her chart and she's looking at me and she's going, most of my patients have lost their hair by this point. And I reached up and said, I did. <laughs> she just about fell out of her chair. But I have to tell you that um, I thought that the reason those wigs at that boutique in the garage cost $200 to $400 was because insurance was paying, because I only paid $35 for mine. But it turns out um, that they knew something that I didn't know. There are many things I don't know. And that is that uh, wigs are designed for people who have hair. Um, and, uh, and people who wear a lot of wigs know that if you don't have hair, you need to wear something called a do-rag. I, I didn't know. I didn't know. Um, but the, key, the, the wigs for cancer patients know that these are going to be worn by people who are bald and have a very sensitive head. And so they have actually hair on the inside of them. Now, this could be why they don't have any wigs for me, because my hair, even if you put it on the inside, it's not going to be smooth. <laughs> it's never been <laughs> accused of being smooth. So anyway, uh, it was August. It was hot. Uh, one of the things about cancer is you have like good days and bad days and this was one of my fairly good days and I was driving my children somewhere and my wig just itched and I wanted to take it off and my children who were six and ten they're like oh mommy take it off nobody will notice I'm like yeah no you know I'm, I know you're ten but you cannot go from afro to bald in one second while you're on the road you will cause an accident oh mommy well, the temptation was great, and we got to a stoplight. And I thought, well, I'm not going to cause a, a, an accident on a stoplight, right? So <clears throat> I took it off. Well, my little daughter, who said no one's going to notice, if somebody noticed, she wanted to see it. <laughs> so she was watching. And she said, Mommy, the guy in the pickup truck next to us, his eyes just bugged out of his head. <laughs> Sometimes people ask me, did you lose all your hair? And uh, the answer is no, actually, not at least not at first. Um, I was on uh, really aggressive chemo. Um, sometimes uh, I'm afraid people will say, oh, you can talk like this because it was easy for you. And I, I just need you to know that um, very early in my journey, I, I found an article that said that my average life expectancy was seven months. I was not told that by a doctor, but let me tell you, seeing it in writing was not all that encouraging. Um, that was 12 years ago. So, um, and the chemo that I was on was what they called the old broad spectrum stuff. So I was very, very sick during this time. And so when I talk about um, going through this valley, I do, I do speak from someone who went there, okay? Um, but when I got to my second set of, of chemo, it was Texatir. That's the one you hear about on the news that your hair goes away and doesn't come back. Um, actually, at that point in time, I lost my eyebrows and eyelashes, and <clears throat> my eyebrows have not come back. I, I, uh, I try not to mention it because people don't notice. But if ever I say anything, they're like, well, just draw them on. Here's the thing, okay? They're, they're actually still itchy, okay? And, um, and while people don't necessarily notice that I don't have eyebrows, one and a half eyebrows, they notice every time, okay? So they don't do that. I just have to live with Was My eyelashes started, um, started falling into my eyes, and it was so painful. So I, I went to my ecologist, she's like, never heard of that. She looked at me and she's like, oh, you have really long eyelashes. Yeah, I thought that was a good thing. Oh, you have really thick glasses. Oh yeah, I know that. So when I blink, my eyelashes were hitting the inside of my glasses and it was knocking them into my eyes. And she said, what you need is to get your eyelashes trimmed. Now, <clears throat> You know, I've been to a few salons, but eyelash trimming is on the list of services at no salon ever. So I go into this salon and I say, I'd like to have my eyelashes trimmed. And they're like, oh no, honey, we do extensions. We don't do trimming. I'm like, yeah, I know, but I'd really like them trimmed. And they're like, oh no, honey, 
your eyelashes would look stubby. Now let me let me just paint this picture for you, okay? I am like halfway through chemo. I look more green than normal, which is kind of a green tint anyway, but I am like seriously green at this point. Um, and my eyes are like red and bloodshot from crying from these eyelashes falling in. And my, my wig, it, yeah, it was my hair, but it was getting a little aged. And, and I just have to tell you that I was not in the running for Miss USA. And stubby eyelashes were not going to be the one thing that kept me from my crown. So, and I was too sick to debate. So I looked around, I'm like, huh, OK. It's a weekday morning, very early. There's a couple of employees and two customers. Damage is limited. OK, I'm a cancer patient. I don't care. And they said, right this way, ma'am. And they took me in a private room. And they were so kind and gentle with me as they trimmed my lashes. Sometimes as cancer patients, we do not deserve the kindness that is shown to us. None of us ever deserves the kindness that is shown to us. But I do want to share with you today about the special needs and um, issues with helping your friend with cancer and also the amazing opportunity that you have. And I think that some of what I share today is going to be applicable to where we are right now as a world, and that is right now we're facing coronavirus. And we planned to videotape this this morning before we knew that that's what we would have to do today. And I'm just, I'm grateful for that. Um, so let me show you our agenda. Uh, okay, where do I go here? All right, so that little introduction uh, is uh, what I've been practicing at Open Mic Comedy uh, for a year to get prepared to share this with you. As I said in the beginning, um, comedy, laughter is a powerful weapon against fear. And it's something that we can use to when you know here in Florida we're pretty used to um, impending disasters <laughs> you know hurricanes coming and there's a there's a line between preparation and panic okay and honestly not one of us has ever navigated that line hundred percent correctly <laughs> but laughter can push us back out of the panic and into the preparation and appropriate reaction and so that's one of the tools that I use so um, so anyway, that, that was my introduction that we just went through. I'm going to talk about how to offer less. And that's kind of a funny thing to say, but it's really the most important thing. I'm going to talk about how to ask for more. And one of the things that we can do uh, as, a, as a help to our friend with cancer is actually coordinate care from others. So um, the, the ask for more is helpful not only for people who are actually going through Valley right now, but actually people who are coordinating for someone who is. And then uh, taking care of your volunteers. I'm going to talk about some of the unexpected things that happen when you're help helping someone who has cancer and how to uh, not be surprised by that. And then your presence is the best present. And then we're going to have some Q&A at the end. Now, I'm not sure how Q&A is going to go. I haven't figured out how I'm going to know if you're asking me a question on Facebook without stopping recording. So we'll figure that out when we get there. And then at the end, um, I have a drawing. So that's, that's uh, how we think this is going to go. And if there's nobody asking questions, that question and answer period on the end might be kind of short. So we'll see how it goes. All right. So let's talk. Uh, let's see what's next here. OK, so we did that. And we're going to talk about offering less. Okay, where is my mouse? Hello, hello. Oh, okay. So I want to talk to you about social etiquette. We are taught as children to say please and thank you. And we're also taught some social etiquette rote responses that are very powerful and very important to us as a society. And one of the things that um, we're taught, and I, I, I taught this to my children, and I'm going to sing it for you, and I hope I'm not off key. <laughs> good morning, good morning, how do you do? Good morning, good morning, I'm fine, how are you? That's one of the things that we're taught. And, and you all know the uncomfortable place that you can be in if someone doesn't answer 
I'm fine, how are you? And if they tell you how they really are. So um, it, 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 there's another social nuance that will help me explain what I'm talking about here. And that's if you see someone you haven't seen for a long time, and, you, and you, how do you end that conversation? And the correct way to end that conversation, at least the way I've been taught, is to say, it was so wonderful to see you, we're gonna have to do this again. What does that mean? It means I'm done talking to you. Does it mean we're going to get together again? Maybe, maybe not. If you meant it, you would put some specifics on it. You would say, it was wonderful to see you. We're going to have to do the, this again. You know what? Could we do lunch next week, Tuesday or Thursday? Now you mean it. Okay, do you see how putting those examples on the end took it from a, what you're supposed to say to something you actually mean? All right? Now. We're going to get to this one, if there's anything I can do. We are taught, as a society, that if we, um, I'm not sure, why, <laughs> not sure why this is making me sad, but maybe just because of where we all are right now, but if we know someone who's going through a really hard time, what we're supposed to say is, if there's anything I can do, let me know. But it doesn't mean anything. That phrase is telling us what we should be doing and saying it isn't doing it. So I want to talk into this a little bit more, all right? So let me see. All right, so what we want to do, we want to say that line, but on the end of it, we want to offer less. We want to have examples that show our limits that are actionable because when you say, if there's anything I can do, let me know, that is not actionable. The person hearing it doesn't know if you're saying, I'm fine, how are you, and you're, something horrible is happening in your life, or if you're really fine. They don't know. They don't know. But by putting examples on it and giving actionable offers, it changes and it makes it something that can be done. All right. So we're going to give, we're going to show examples of offers. So, um, so here's Judy. And she comes up and she says, if there's anything I can do, let me know. And then here's Mary. And she comes up and she says, if there's anything I can do, let me know. Would you like pizza, McDonald's, Chick-fil-A? All right. Now, here's Sue. We, I, the reason I'm using meals here is because one of the things that our church does is any new baby, surgery, a loss we just lost. Hmm, we lost and uh, we brought to that family. So we, so we bring meals. We use take them a meal to coordinate that. Um, but so I'm using meals here. So Sue is saying, would you like beef stew, chicken and rice? Do you have any dietary restrictions? OK. And then Diane. And Diane's saying, I'm in your area every other Friday. I could stop by and do dishes, laundry, wash windows. May I call and see if there's anything you need? Now, there's a couple things I want you to see about that example. And the first thing is she said, I'm in your area every other Friday. So she's not saying, I can come anytime and do anything. She's putting a limit. The other thing she's saying is, this is not a big deal for me. I'm already there. Those are both important factors. All right. Now, we're going to do an example here. So sometimes when you offer someone, the person you're offering will take you up on the spot. But more often than not, they won't. They won't know what they need at the time that you ask. So when a need arises, they're going to have to reach out to someone. And who are they going to reach out to? All right? So if you look at this example here, so now our cancer patient has relatives coming in town. The house is a wreck. There's no food. And the nieces and nephews love pizza. Who would you call? OK? Let's assume it's a Tuesday. and the the relatives are coming on Wednesday, all right? Who are you going to call? Well, you can't, you can't call Diane because she's available on Fridays. I mean, you could, but the chances of her being available are lower, right? But Mary said she would buy pizza. That's an easy ask. It's been offered. So in my opinion, as a cancer patient, the first person I'd call would be Mary, OK? The second person I'd call would be Diane, just to check, OK? The third person I'd call would be Sue. And the last person I'd call would be Judy. 
because I don't know if Judy meant anything by what she said. That's really important. That's kind of the most important thing I want to teach you in this class, is by offering less, having examples that show your limits, that are actionable, you will have a greater chance of actually being able to help your friend. All right. Now, uh, <laughs> this is a, a picture of me. I, I uh, call myself recliner woman because I spent about nine months in the recliner. And uh, <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you. And this is something I've seen other people talk about. And uh, I've got kind of a little different twist on it. But uh, what I've seen online is they say, um, dump out comfort in. Okay, and that's somebody else's, that's somebody else's uh, uh, idea, and I love it. I think that's a really, really appropriate thing to say. Don't look to the spouse of the cancer patient to comfort you in your grief. <laughs> Go to your own spouse. <laughs> that, that, that guy has enough on his plate. But what I want to talk about is, uh, is, is how where we are in relationship to the cancer patient changes how we help them. All right? So... The first group is what I call the A team. <laughs> and whether your cancer patient is using Western medicine or Eastern medicine or all of the above, the A team is the one whose plan we want to come together, okay? And we do not want to get in their way. Anything that we do is surrounding and supporting and never in the way of the people who are fighting for our patient's life. The next circle outside of that is what I call the B team. And those are our best friends forever. Those are our very best friend, our family that is in the house with us, uh, maybe a, a family that's in town. These are the people who are gonna know on a day-by-day -day basis what's going on with us. They're not reaching out because we have cancer. They're already in our lives, very intimately connected to us. Um, they probably don't need this class. <laughs> they are like here <laughs> with helping the cancer patient, okay? So that's not who this class is to. This class is actually to the C team, all right? That's community, church, coworkers, uh, neighbors, um, all the people that are that know you, but and also when I say community, I mean geographically close, okay? Because there are things you can do when you're geographically close that you can't do when you're far away. You, if you live in Utah and I'm here in Florida, you're not gonna stop by and mow my grass, okay? So community is huge, all right? Then the next team is the D team, and that's the distant team. So that's, uh, maybe it's, uh, I mean, when I was going through cancer, my sisters were in the D team. They were all distant from me. My mom was in the D team, okay? Um, so sometimes, like, they would fly in. One sister flew in and, and stayed with me for a week. Uh, another sister was actually living on a boat, and she brought her boat up uh, to the coast nearest us and took my children. Um, and so the weeks when I was the sickest, my children went and stayed with her on the boat. Uh, so sometimes that D team can come on site to help you, but there's different things you do as part of the D team, okay? And then the last team is E for everyone. And those are all the um, fundraisers, the walks, the runs, the bakes, the, all those things. And I, I even, I made a t-shirt that says, if you have run, walked, baked, whatever, Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, when I was going through cancer, and like I said, it's been 12 years now, but I heard a, a, an oncologist from the VA in Tampa, and he explained that he worked with uh, veterans and that he had been there for 20 years, okay? So that was 30 years ago. And when those veterans would come in, they were, they were pretty much smokers, and they were coming in with neck, throat, and lung cancer, and their five-year survival rate was 20%. But 20 years later, which was, now, which was now 10 years ago now, he was at the VA. He was working with veterans. They were primarily smokers. They were coming in with the same kind of cancer. They were coming in with the same 
stage of cancer, okay? But their five-year survival rate was 80%. All those things that we've done, all the research that we've done, we have learned. There are many, many more people surviving today than ever before. And what that means is that there's more people for you to help and there's more hope. And so that's a great thing. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So now that we've talked about what team we're on, we're going to talk a little bit about the kinds of things you can do and how that varies by team. All right. So what could you offer? So one of the things that I needed was rides. And I, I've been talking to friends about like, which cancer patient actually needs help? Um, and, and I was in the category that needed help the most because I had no close family in town. I had school-aged children. My husband actually had a motorcycle accident the year before and used up all of his PTO. So he was earning PTO like a half a day a month. And so I did all, he works at a hospital. And so I did all of my um, doctor appointments actually on the campus where he worked. So he didn't have to take time off. I had to get myself there and get myself back. But if I needed him during the appointment, he could just run over, take an hour and get back. But I needed rides. Um, a lot of people don't. Uh, but, but know that any time there's a cancer patient with small children, they are going to be in need of much more help than someone else. The other thing of who would be especially in need is an older person who does not have family close by. So those are the two really highest risk for, for that they would need a ride. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about when you're talking about how you can help is backfill. So one of the things that I do as a, in my job, I'm a consultant, and when I go in to work with a client, I'm going to need their employees' time so much that they won't be able to do their normal job. And so I say, OK, but for what I'm going to do to succeed, that person has to be backfilled. So we have to find somebody else to do what they normally do. So when you think about helping a person with cancer, think about what do they normally do that they might not be able to do now. Now, don't just think about the person with cancer, but also think about the primary caregiver, all right? Especially, again, if you've got a child with cancer, that mother is like nothing she can do of her normal duties. So she has to be backfilled as much as you can. We need to come around her and support her as much as we can. Um, so that's a really important way when you say, what can I do to think of backfill? Well, what do they normally do that they can't do now? So again, um, mowing the lawn, washing the car, cleaning the toilets, washing the windows, doing meal prep. Um, so those are things. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about is backup. Now, this was something I am very grateful. <laughs> I am very grateful that I learned um, before I needed it, OK? I, I, like I said, I needed a lot of rides. And I had this dear neighbor who is no longer with us. He was very old and frail and sweet. And he came over to me and he said, I could help you. I could give you a ride. And I thought, well, yeah, you could get me there, but you, you're too frail to spend the whole day with me and bring me back. But I told him, I said, you know what? You could. You could be my emergency backup. And if, if there's ever someone who calls at the last minute and said, I can't give you a ride, you're right next door. You could give me a ride, and then I can figure out how to get home later. And he's like, OK. Well, what do you know? A couple weeks later, I have a friend who had, and, and a lot of people who were giving me rides were actually taking time off work. They were taking a vacation day to give me a ride. I am so blessed, so, so grateful. But this one friend thought she had the day off. She was a preschool teacher. And they called her in and they said, the other teacher's sick. You've got to come in and cover. So here's their choice, right? Do you stand up your friend who has cancer and needs cancer treatment, or do you leave 22-year-olds unattended and get fired. Hmm, not a good choice. <laughs> so she called me, and uh, she was going with the two-year-olds and keeping her job. And I was able to say, 
don't worry about it. It's covered. I have backup. So don't underestimate the, the power and a, an amazing gift of being willing to be backup, if that's something you can do. All right. Um, and coordination. So one of the things, I, I'm a project manager, and so I'm, coordination is my thing. But, but being able to coordinate is not a prerequisite for a cancer diagnosis. There are a bunch of people, and, and even for me, okay, as a, as a planner, scheduler, coordinator, cancer was like, whoa, so much. I mean, my whole life just switched upside down. Everything was different. It was crazy. And if you're someone who has the ability to coordinate, who has that as a skill, understand that that can be a huge benefit. And that's going to take us uh, to our how to ask for help uh, in a minute. All right, but coordination itself can be a help. Now, you've got to remember where you are in those circle of friendships. You do not want to usurp what is being done by someone in that BFF circle, right? Team B, they're on point. If you can assist them and if they want your assistance, that's great, okay? But don't, don't take over for them. Understand where you are. Those people who are in that B circle, they are hurting and they need our help and they don't need to have to spend time telling us <laughs> what the line is. So we need to be careful there. All right. All right. And that's going to lead us into asking for more. So this part is talking about how to request help. And again, um, we're, we're, we're here learning how to offer help. But understanding the dynamics of asking for help is really powerful too. So I want to talk about that. Okay, how are we doing on time? Oh my goodness, I'm supposed to be doing this transition at 10, it's 10.02. Sweet! All right, let me start by saying that no one likes to say no to a cancer patient. And also say that cancer patients don't like asking. Nobody likes asking. It's really uncomfortable to ask. People, when I was doing the open mic comedy, and people would go, how do you have the guts to get up here and do comedy about cancer? And I looked at them and I said, look, when I was going through cancer on Sunday, I would go to church and I would say, hey, on Friday, I'm going to be too sick to feed myself. Would you like to come over and feed me? That takes more guts. I'm just saying, that takes more guts. It's not comfortable to ask for help. So let's talk about how to do it. And maybe you can help your friend see how to do it, or maybe you can do it on behalf of your friend. All right. So. The way we ask for help is to ask for more. Well, the, the, the default is like you've got this one big need and to ask for that. But it's just like in our church when we do meals and we, and we ask for, um, we ask people in the church to help. We're going to do meals for two weeks. We do not run around and say, okay, can you do Monday? Can you do Monday? Can you do Monday? Can you do Monday? Good. Okay, can you do Tuesday? Can you do, no. Okay, we go, we say, we're doing these 10 days. Could you do a day? Which day would you like to do? By giving people more options, you increase the chance you're going to get a yes. Okay? Getting a yes is better, both for the person asking and for the person being asked. Okay? So you want to ask for a range of things. You want to ask for big things and little things and make it easy to get a yes. So let's talk about examples. So um, one of the things, uh, I've got these little teeny notes down here in the corner for myself, meals, websites, and blogs. One of the things that my, one of my friends told me, um, when I got my diagnosis, I spent the first 24 hours calling everyone I knew and telling them, um, all the people who would be offended if they didn't hear it from me personally. And one of those people said, you're not going to be able to maintain this, Marla. You need to have a, a blog site. And she told me about CaringBridge. Um, now, back then, there were two websites that did this, but CaringBridge is the only one still available. It's amazing. It's free. You just go on there. You set up your site. And then you um, people have to sign up. And then they get an email notification that you've posted. And then they choose when they go read it. 
And that was wonderful because I could post as much as I wanted. And I didn't have to decide who I would send this one to and who I wouldn't. I didn't have to worry about sending them too much. And then there was a place on there where they could, they could do comments back to me. And those comments were for everyone to see. Now, some people actually emailed me privately, and that was, that was great. But, but most people just posted right on there for everyone to see. And, and one of the people um, who I call my champion um, commenter <laughs> was Mary. And, and Mary would just have a little line, and, and, and right, now I have, I, right now I can't remember what she would say. But a lot of days, no one posted there except Mary. It was so nice that Mary had posted. Don't, don't overlook the benefit of the little things, OK? Um, so when you're asking for the big things, you know, can you give me a ride? Can you take my children for the night? Can you bring a meal? Can you pray for me? Can you post on my blog? Big things and little things make it easy for people to say yes. So, and then when you're, if you're going to help someone who has cancer, ask them, like, do you need, you know, all these things that they might need? And let's say you're a coworker, right? And you talk to them, and then you go back to all the other coworkers and you say, hey, this is what she needs. Who can do what? And then you come back to her with that. That's a gift. That is a gift. She doesn't have to ask all those people. Do not underestimate how hard it is to ask for help. It's really hard. So doing that on behalf of someone, if you're in that position, that's amazing. So if you're at the church and it's someone in your church and you can ask them what they need and then go back to the church and get that help. So, you know, church, coworkers, neighborhood maybe, if you're the one who can say, what all do you need? Let me see what I can do. And then go get that and bring it back to her or him. <laughs> That's huge. That's huge. OK, so uh, let's see. What else do I got here? All right, so now we're going to talk about taking care of your volunteers. Um, I, I need you to know that uh, Typical etiquette gets uh, uh, stretched <laughs> when you're going through cancer. Uh, I, 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 want, I want to tell you a story about what happened the first time someone brought me a meal. So the first time someone brought me a meal, and I, now I'm getting a meal because I'm too sick to smell food, OK? Uh, I can't even think about food, so I can't cook. It's only for a couple of days, but here I am. And someone comes to the door with the meal. And I got up and I answer the door. Now, please understand, chemo brain is real. You're not thinking clearly. But my husband was, and he's like, what on earth is she doing? So he followed me. So I got to the door. I opened the door. What are they doing? They're bringing me a meal, right? So it's a hot, ready-to-eat meal, right? Open the door, smell hits my face. <clears throat> I turn and run to the bathroom and lose it. Now, this is not an Emily a post approved method of showing gratitude for a meal. <laughs> it's just like, that's not what you're supposed to do. <laughs> Thankfully, oh my goodness, I spent three days in my recliner not moving, thanking God. Because you know what? The cook didn't bring her meal. She sent her husband. Her husband saw my husband over my head, never triggered on what I had just done. But I laid there thinking, Marla, you've got to come up with a plan. That's not something you ever want to do again. And what was I going to say? Oh, that tasted delicious. Everything tasted like metal nails. I couldn't say that. What was I going to say? So I, this is what I came up with. And it's lame, OK? It's lame. But I came up with, excuse me for staying across the room from you. I can't even smell food now. But my family is hungry, and we are grateful. OK? Honesty, but not your normal thanks. OK? I can't say it tastes delicious, because how would I know? <laughs> um, let me see here. What, what, 
What do I, oops, where am I going next? Hang on. So how can you take care of your volunteers? The first is by giving them as much notice as possible about what you're going to need. Sometimes you don't know. Sometimes you don't know. But if you do, tell them as far in advance as you can. My mother, I ended up needing rides. Like, um, I had chemo every other week for four months. But I not only needed a ride on the day of chemo, but I handled it so badly that they had to come, have me come in for intravenous fluids for the following three days. So I had to have rides four days in a row every two weeks. That's a lot of rides. So when, my, when I found out that, my mother said, don't ask one chemo at a time. Put down everything you know. And like I said before, I mentioned people were taking PTO. You have to plan that in advance. You can't just call your boss and say, hey, I'm not coming in tomorrow. I'm doing a favor for a friend. That doesn't fly, OK? You can say, I'm not coming in in three weeks. I'm taking the day off. And you don't even have to say why, OK? But so you see, so advance notice is one way of taking care of your volunteers. Um, the other thing is, like I mentioned before, backup. If, if you have backup in place, so you not only arrange for, let's say you're arranging rides, you not only arrange for rides, but you also arrange for someone who could do backup if that falls through, that's a gift to your volunteer as well as to the cancer patient, okay? Because nobody likes standing up a cancer patient. That does not feel good, all right? But the one I want to spend a little time on is follow-up. Um, sometimes when you do something good for a person with cancer, it does not go the way you thought it would. I, um, we, we get, you know, we bring meals to, uh, a mother with a new baby. <laughs> it's so cool. It's just so beautiful. And we take a meal to someone who's had surgery. And we're so glad that they're through it and they're going to get better. And you take a meal to someone with cancer and you don't know if they're going to live. And they probably look worse than the last time you saw them. And it's, sometimes it's heartbreaking. It's hard. It's hard. Um, don't. Don't underestimate how hard it is. And people don't know what to say. Um, I want, I want, I can't tell you what to say, all right? But I can tell you a couple of things. Um, I had, um, I got so sick that there was one day I was sitting in my recliner and somehow it felt like inside my head that my brain was swishing back and forth. And I was just totally distracted by what was happening in me. And I, I really wasn't even aware of who was around me. And, and my husband came up and asked me a question, and I didn't hear him. And he was like, Marla. And he got my attention, and I looked at him, and I heard it, and I answered. And then I slipped back into this. What was going on inside of me was overwhelming. There's nothing that anyone could have said that day that would have made any difference about where I was. I had, <clears throat> I talked about the different people who gave me a ride to cancer. I don't remember what any of them said. Um, I, I apologize if that offends someone. I do remember uh, one person specifically talking about what was going on in their life and what a gift that was to me. Uh, several people told me about what was going on in their life. Um, and part of that was because uh, the way that my body handles nausea is that I can't talk. It, it triggers losing it. And so I couldn't talk to them. So I would, or very, very little. So I, I, would, I would ask them a question. I would say, I'm sorry, I can't talk. Please talk to me. And then I would ask them a question. And, and uh, hopefully they would be able to talk for a while. Um, I, had a, I had a friend that I knew that wasn't going to work, and so I brought along a tape, a CD for us to listen to on the drive. Um, but I had one day, 
And I, had a, I was so sick. I was so sick. I couldn't speak. I was so sick. And my friend brought me. We didn't talk at all on the drive, neither of us. And we got there, and she told the nurse, she said, she's not doing very well. And the nurse said, that's just because she's scared. And I thought, you know, that's really odd, because my heart is at peace. But maybe my body is just scared, because <laughs> it knows what's coming. I don't know. Um, but this friend was so amazing. She brought me a blanket. She just, you know, she just served me. And two years later, I went back to her. I was preparing us to talk about this, and I went back to her. And I wanted to talk to her about two things, um, and this was one of them. And I said, I, am, I just want you to know my memory of that day and how grateful I am for how you took care of me. And she said, oh, I always felt bad about that day because I just didn't know what to say. Oh, for Pete's sake, I couldn't have heard her if she spoke. So don't worry so much about talking. Be there. Just, just understand how important it is to serve, to do, to help. Your words, like, like if someone's going through a breakup and you can say words that comfort them, that's cool. But if someone's going through cancer, your words don't have any impact on the outcome of their diagnosis. Don't, don't be so, so worried about saying the wrong thing. Say less. Just be. Just help. Just do. But do more. Um, the other thing I need to tell you is this bottom one, emotions that are not physical. And that same friend, oh, she went on vacation and she brought me a prayer candle that she got out on the West Coast. She was across the country from me. She went to a mission and she saw a prayer candle. It was pink and she thought of me. She bought it for me and she brought it to me. Isn't that great? I was so angry. How dare she? Do you know how overwhelmed I was with all the medicine that I had? I had to figure out where all this stuff went. And now she thinks that in addition to all that, I am supposed to rearrange the knickknacks in my house to figure out where to put this stupid candle. And somewhere in there, I was like, what on earth just happened? And I kind of looked around my house, and I'm like, Marla, you adore candles. You have dozens of them. And look, there's a spot. Put the candle there. And I was like, oh, that was weird. That was weird. It wasn't real. It was triggered by all the medicine that I was on. It wasn't real. And the reason I went back to her two years later was because as I was thinking through and kind of coming out of the muddle enough to remember everything, and I thought, I wonder, I wonder how badly I behaved toward her. I wonder if I need to apologize. The good news is that apparently I lost it after she left, so she didn't know. But that's not always going to happen. So when I say take care of your volunteers, if you're one of these people who have coordinated for others, and somebody does something, and then they come back, and they're just like, you know, oh, did you? And they go, yeah. And they, they act weird. Follow up on that. Ask them what happened. And then tell them this. You need to give the cancer patient grace. They are in a place, thank God, we cannot imagine. They just need grace. Don't worry so much about you. Your gift to them was a gift to them, no matter how they responded. And then if you're, if you're, if you're ever in a place where you, if it's ever you who responds badly, when you realize it, come up with a way to say thank you later. Go back and say thank you. Um, it's never too late to say thank you. So that is uh, taking care of your volunteers. I just, you know, I've seen people respond to someone going through cancer that they're not behaving like they should. And it's like, well, yeah, well, they can't. They can't. They have cancer. And that's, you know, 
it's it's really weird. Cancer is is weird because, like I said before, it's this it's this peaks and valleys, you know, and so you have good days and you have bad days, and so sometimes you can and sometimes you can't, and and you don't you can't predict what days. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Um, so, give them grace. Give them grace. Acts twenty thirty five says, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said is more blessed to give than to receive. And I just want to say, sometimes cancer patients don't actually like to receive. They, they don't, they don't, I don't want any help. I don't need any help. And uh, you know, we're like that when we're two. I can do it my own self. I don't want to admit how sick I am. I don't want to admit how much help I need. Um, I had, I had a friend give me some money and I was like, that's too much. That's too much. And I felt, I realized that if I had a choice between giving someone else that much money or having cancer, I would give them money. <laughs> like, on the table, baby. <laughs> So, um, but you need to understand when you're reaching out to help someone who's going through cancer that, th that they're not just laying around wishing you would give them stuff. They, they may need stuff, but they don't necessarily want to admit that they need it. So one of the things that happened when I was going through my valley is that people were so gracious to me. They did like these huge, wonderful things for me and made it sound like I was doing them a favor. Um, the person who gave me money said, I lost my mother to cancer. I would like to give you this money because I loved her. And it was like, well, you know, like you're going to say no to that? And it, it made it easier for me. Um, a lot of times when we're helping people, like, we think, you know, it's more blessed to give to, than to receive. I'm going to feel, I'm doing this to feel good myself. I need you to understand, okay? Helping a person with cancer is not to make you feel good. That's not what it's about. You are showing up in their life to be a blessing to them. I, I, the best illustration I can give for this is being an honor guard for a military funeral. There is nobody who feels good, like it makes them feel better that they're an honor guard for a military funeral. It is honor, not joy. That's what it is when you help someone with cancer. It's honor. It's your honor to help them. It's not about you feeling good. It's your honor. And it's so, so needed, so appreciated. Even when it's not appreciated, <laughs> even when they can't show that they appreciate it, they still need it. And you're, <sighs> um, I want to talk about just being there. Your presence is the best present. I have a friend who lost her husband in June of this past year. And I was talking to her about this class and she said, and I asked her if I could quote it. And she said, just be with them. It's the hardest thing, but it's the best thing. Make the effort to be uncomfortable and be there. Um, my friend Nancy, uh, uh, best friend from, I actually have more than one best friend. It's really cool. <laughs> but, uh, but Nancy and I have been. Uh, best friends from high school, and uh, she came down to celebrate her 50th birthday and ended up being in my house on one of my worst days when I had to have someone there to feed me. And, uh, and that day also uh, a coworker, uh, well, a client coworker that I, uh, he, he passed away. And that was the day that I cried. I was actually the only day in all of my valley of cancer that I cried. And uh, she was there to hug me. And I think, I think she would have not believed me. 
she would have felt shorted if I hadn't cried on her shoulder. <laughs> so God knew who I needed when I needed to cry. Um, my friend uh, Nora, which people at Crossings know Nora, she's our pastor's wife, and, and she, uh, she just went with me to uh, a bone scan. And they actually let her sit in the room while that bone scan happened. And at the end, she said that now she knows me inside and out. <laughs> but the, the first day, my first worst day, uh, I, I didn't know how bad it was going to be. I didn't know I was going to need somebody to feed me. And they had thrown so many things, you know, do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. And then the day of chemo, they threw a whole nother twist on me and said, do the things we told you not to do and don't do these other things that we've never mentioned before. And I was just like, oh, and I'm laying in this chair. I can't even think about food. I don't have any idea what to eat. And they said, you have to eat, you have to drink, and I can't get out of the chair. And I've got a phone beside me. I don't know who to call. I don't have any phone numbers. And I just cried out to God. And I said, God, I don't even know who to call. The only one I can think of who would help, who could even think of what I should eat right now is Nora, because she was on this kind of weird, healthy diet right then. That, and maybe she always is, but she was the only one I could figure out who could figure out what I could eat. And 10 minutes later, she called me. She's going to get sick of me telling this story, but I will never get sick of remembering that on my worst day, when I was alone and helpless, I called out to God, and God sent Nora. I was not alone. That's what you have the opportunity to do when you help a friend with cancer. And then I want to talk about Jenny. Uh, uh, Jenny was a preschool teacher at my daughter's preschool. And so we knew each other, we liked each other, but we didn't really have a very close relationship. And uh, I ran into her in, like I was at a store I don't go to very often, and, and we ran into each other in the parking lot, so she knew that I had cancer. And then about nine months later, I'm, I'm through, I'm cancer free, I run into her in the parking lot, she has cancer. So I got home and I said, okay, God, that was too weird. You must need me to contact her. So I, I got her number, I called her, and I talked through, because God has had this on my heart since, since then about helping, helping people. And, and, and those of you who know me know that when someone in our church is diagnosed with cancer, boom, I'm there, I'm comforting them, I'm encouraging them, and, uh, and uh, rallying others around them. And so I called her, and I, I went through all the things. What, what do you need? What do you need? She needed nothing. She we needed nothing. And I was kind of confused, and I'm like, okay, God, clearly you want me to be talking to this woman, but what is it you want me to do? And then I remembered, okay, this was really weird, but on the morning after chemo, this isn't for everybody, but it was for me, on the morning after chemo, they had given me so much drugs to deal with the chemo. I felt great. I wasn't allowed to touch anybody, but I felt great. And I always wished that I could talk to somebody, because I could talk. And, uh, but I, I couldn't ask for that. I was asking for so much else. But I realized I drove by her house every morning on my way to work. So I said, hey, hey, what if I stop by the morning after chemo? She's like, oh, I don't know. I'm like, yeah, no one does. Here's what I'll do. I'll call you as I'm driving by, and if you feel good, and if you want me to come in, you answer and say yes. And if you don't answer, I won't come. And if you say, no, I don't feel good, I won't come, I won't be hurt. Well, turns out, she was like me. And so I, I came. And the second time, oh, she was so excited to see me. And the third time, I said, I'm your morning after friend. <laughs> and then the fourth time, she said, you don't know what these visits mean to me. And I was like, well, I mean, I kind of do, because I, she's like, no, she said, you know what chemo is like. It's, like. it's like someone shot a bullet, and it's coming at you, and you can't get out of the way. I'm like, oh, yeah, I know. And she's like, you, you think about it. And, and she says, but everything, I, I think about chemo, and then I think in the morning after Marla's coming, and it distracts me from the fear, and I focus on our friendship. Wow, wow, wow. Listen, if you're a cancer survivor, when you visit someone who's going through cancer, if, if you're not, if you're just someone that loves them, you're love in the flesh. But if you're a cancer survivor and you visit them, you're hope in the flesh.
that's it guys <laughs> i i just need you to know how much whew, how much all the help i was given meant to me it was such a gift um so that's that's it say tom since you're here do you have any questions for me no turns out i just found out today that tom is a survivor also so that's pretty amazing that that god would give me a another cancer survivor to help me with this um so what i want to do is when i post this on facebook um i want to uh give away i'm going to give away 50 books so I, I want people to, if you're interested in a book, say so. I'm going to give away no more than one book a day and no more than, um, and I'm not going to have a drawing unless I have at least 10 people in the drawing for it. Okay, so I don't know how long the 50 books are going to last, but I'll, I'll keep it posted under the video where we at with the 50 books. So if you would like to be in the drawing for my book, let me show you the book. Um, this is Praise PhD. Praising God in the Middle of Your Valley. So uh, when I was at the beginning of my uh, journey through cancer, I mentioned that my kids were 10 and 6. And <laughs> we were singing that song from Steve, uh, Steve Green about do all things without grumbling and complaining. And I, and I was like, okay, God, what does it look like to go through cancer treatment without grumbling and complaining? And God gave me... Uh, uh, an example through uh, Jeff and Andrea Cushman who uh, their life is a medical emergency all the time and I got to see them go through yet another medical hiccup and I saw them praise God and be grateful and laugh and and so those are the three things that I made a commitment to do every day during my cancer journey and I learned I learned things about praise that I had never understood before and this this book is, uh, is what I learned, my five, five levels of praise. And, uh, you know, I have been there. If somebody who hasn't been there says you should be praising God now, they haven't earned that right. But I did. <laughs> I can tell you what it really means to praise God in the middle of awful. So, uh, so if you'd like a copy of that book, uh, put your, your in, the, in the comments below the video, say, uh, I would like a copy of your book, uh, Praise PhD, and then we'll put you in the drawing. And if you win, I'll reach out to you. And I think that's going to be it. We're going to wrap it up. Thank you so much. God bless you. Uh, look for laughter even now as coronavirus is swirling around us. We're alive. We're laughing. Move back out of the panic into the preparation. And God bless you. Bye-bye.